Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of the Tonavar in the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relatives' relations, past, present, and emerging. Today, we are joined by Brian Kramer. Brian is an Egyptologist at the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art at California State, San Bernardino, where he is in charge of developing content related to the museum's collections of artifacts from ancient Egypt. He is also a lecturer in the history department at CSUSB. Brian has a master's in Egyptology from the University of Chicago and a master's in archaeological computing from Southampton University. He is also working on finishing his PhD in Egyptology at the University of Chicago. Brian's research interests are in ancient Egyptian religion and ritual, ancient Egypt and the classical world, ancient Egyptian language, art, and archaeology, digital humanities, GIS, and digital frontiers in museums. He has worked and studied in Egypt over the last 20 years and taught ancient Egyptian language and archaeology at University of Chicago, Princeton University, and California State University, San Bernardino. Brian is currently working on a monograph on his work with the Festival of Osiris at Abydos and a 3D archaeological atlas of maps from his work as the co-director of the Wadi al Hudi expedition. Join me in thanking Brian for joining us. Well, thank you, Carly, for that introduction. And hello to everyone. I'd like to thank the Kotzen Institute for having me at this brown bag lecture. I wish I could be there in person, but this format actually offers a few advantages, um, one of which is we can have so many people here. Thank you to Carly Pope, especially for inviting me to this talk. The Wadi El Hudi expedition is very fortunate to have the talented help of people like Carly in the field with us to face all the challenges that seem to come at us nonstop in a typical field season. Thank you furthermore to all of the team members of the Wadi El Hudi expedition who have made this work possible. Fortunately, I cannot cite you all in person for every single thing that you've made in this lecture, but uh, I'll try and assume it all in this slide. Thank you. Since 2014, the Wadi El Hudi expedition has been documenting a series of archeological sites in the region of Egypt's Eastern desert, Southeast of the city of Aswan. I'm one of the co-directors on this project, along with Kate Liska and Meredith Brand. My chief responsibilities have been running the archeological survey and mapping and the epigraphic documentation and inscriptions. In antiquity, groups of people came out to this region in the desert from the Nile Valley in order to mine an exceptional uh, amount of mineral resources that are found uniquely. Prior to our work at Wadi El Hudi, the Egyptologist Ahmed Fakhri came to Wadi El Hudi and published notes about 14 of the archeological sites that are found here, and especially the inscriptions that he found on them. He published that in 1952. Uh, other work has been done, done at Wadi El Hudi briefly in the 1990s. There was the work of Ian Shaw and Robert Jameson who surveyed some of the sites, and then uh, immediately after them, Dietrich and Rosemary Clem uh, investigated especially the geoarchaeology of the area. It appears, um, however, that uh, these investigations were mostly preliminary uh, and the different aspects of the archeological sites uh, were focused on especially the geology and the inscriptions. Before our expedition to Wadi Yehudi, no one had seriously studied the archeological deposits to any great degree. And so far we have documented the presence of some 41 archeological sites spanning at least 300,000 years of human history. And these sites range in size from small flint working areas to large fortified settlements and mines. But the largest archaeological sites from Wadi El Hudi are from Egypt's Middle Kingdom, uh, dating circa 2000 to 1700 BC, and from the early Roman period, circa 30 BCE to 100 CE. Since 2016, our work has especially become a race against time. In that year, the Egyptian government opened up the deserts to new gold prospecting by large international mining companies. And by the time that we got to our 2016 field season, two ancient sites at Wadi El Hudi had become modern gold mines. Prospectors are still going around the desert looking for new areas to find trace gold on the surface. And these activities put the archaeology of Wadi El Hudi and much of the 
Eastern Desert at risk of destruction. Also in 2016, we received a grant from the American Research Center in Egypt to make emergency documentation of the sites at Wadi al Hudi in order to get ahead of these new mines. And that was very fortuitous because we've not been able to visit six of these sites since we documented them in 2016 because of modern mining. Fortunately, the important sites that I'm going to talk about today are mostly still accessible, but the threats continue to loom large over them. This region of Wadi al Hudi was anciently known as being a source of a uniquely rich deposit of amethyst. In fact, we do not have an ancient name for Wadi al Hudi. It was simply referred to in the text that we have as the region of amethyst, Hesmond. Amethyst is a variety of quartz, sorry, that did it by itself, a variety of quartz with irradiated traces of iron particles in it that give it a distinctly reddish or purplish color. At Wadi al Hudi, the mineral is a deep purple in the best veins of quartz, quartz and a pinkish color in the lesser quality veins. Oh, I got to advance more than once. Okay, uh, a real vogue for amethyst apparently started uh, in the Middle Kingdom when the mines at Wadi Hudi were opened. And pharaohs of that time especially sent expeditions to Wadi Hudi in order to mine the amethyst, which was used to make jewelry, uh, of many grades of quality. Some of the most beautiful objects that, you could, that have been found in royal and non-royal burials of the Middle Kingdom are made from amethyst from Wadi al Hudi. Three mines and settlements at Wadi al Hudi, sites four, five, and nine were used during Egypt's Middle Kingdom in order to mine the majority of the amethyst from that period. They are situated uh, from one to two kilometers away from each other. And anciently, they were linked by walking paths. It appears that during the Middle Kingdom, the expeditions for amethyst happened sporadically, according to the inscriptional record that we have of them. At the time of an expedition, an official was entrusted by the pharaoh to organize the complicated logistics of getting up to 1,500 men into the desert, feeding them and watering them, organizing the labor to extract sufficient amethyst, and, the, and then getting them back safely. This necessarily involved building fortified camps to house the miners, organizing and supplying the labor force, excavating the amethyst from the quartz, refining it, and returning with it to Egypt. And it is important to know that so far as we've been able to discover, almost all of the supplies for the mining must have come from the Nile Valley. Almost all of the food, all of the water, and the fuel came from Egypt. With the exception of tools, which you can actually still find in their local source from uh, outcrops of diorite on the stone. These expeditions were nevertheless major logistical undertakings. The mining sites at Wadi al Hudi take a typical form represented here by site five. Each site consists on one hand of a large open pit mine in the ground where ancient miners extracted the amethyst from the quartz veins that run through granite or granitoid bedrock. And on the other hand, next to the mine, there is a substantial fortified settlement built to house the miners, to organize and control the stages of labor, and to protect the supplies. The settlement at Site 5 has a peculiar form since it is structured to take advantage of a hill to provide a protected high ground overlooking the mines and the surrounding area. The structure of the walls in Site 5 is quite complicated, and it organizes the space into different activity areas that we can actually start to identify based on the artifacts left in each room. For instance, the upper court, uh, likely the upper courtyard here, uh, likely served as a location for storing, for guarding, and distributing supplies from the Nara Valley, based on the numerous fragments of storage jars that we found. And the northwest area of the site was a location for housing the workers. The area of the upper point has a set of three rooms, which likely served especially as a place for refining and sorting amethyst out of the mined quartz debris brought from below. And Carly happens to have excavated the trench in a hallway here from which we removed 375 kilograms of quartz debris. And we didn't actually finish that trench, so there's still a lot more left there. Uh, these were small rooms with high walls, which probably served as places where supervisors could watch over a small set of workers who are taking the final sorting of the amethyst and throwing away the quartz. Site nine is another fortified settlement in a mine complex. It is situated about a kilometer away from site five. It was distinctly made in a different way that mostly has to do with the nature of the terrain. Instead of being on a rocky hill, site nine is built on one large as one large stone enclosure 
and situated in an open sandy plain next to the mine. And this building interestingly takes the shape of a typical Middle Kingdom plains style fortress, which are fortresses that were built out of mud brick on a much larger scale in the Nile Valley of Nubia. Buhan is perhaps the largest and most famous of these plain fortresses, but uh, there are other examples in, um, that have been preserved and studied. Site 9 has several rooms in it that are similar in design to the storage blocks, the granaries, and the command posts in these Nubian fortresses. But apart from those structural similarities, the purpose of rooms in Site 9 is not as easy to discover from the surface deposits there uh, as it was at Site 5, and we need to do more work in them to figure out what they were used for. It's also clear that Site 9 had at least two phases of construction, and we have discovered evidence that it was built at approximately the same time as those fortresses in the Nile Valley in the reign of Sun I, approximately 1970 to 1926 BC. Four similar fortified settlements have recently been discovered in the desert to the south of Wadi Yohudi, and these are made out of the same dry stone construction technique that you found in Site 9, and they're built in a similar ground plan. These two are likely contemporary to Wadi Yohudi, and they were involved in mining amethyst, among other minerals. They demonstrate that Wadi Yohudi was just part of an expansive effort by the early Middle Kingdom to exploit mineral resources in this part of the Eastern Desert. And it was much larger before two years ago. Um, before two years ago, we, we didn't know that this effort was as large as it was. In our 2016 field season, we started new work on one of the lesser understood sites in the region, Site 4. Ahmed Fahri's brief comments about this site uh, completely misled uh, previous research into it because it, it, he considered it to be just a Roman uh, uh, encampment. But as soon as we started intensively mapping the site, and especially once we started excavating there, we found out that Site 4 was also a large Middle Kingdom fortified settlement built to protect miners who were working in an amethyst mine nearby. The Middle Kingdom walls are still actually um, visible, about dismantled down to their foundations in areas around the Roman walls. And the early Roman um, miners, uh, the first thing they did may have been just to reconstruct the entire camp that they found from the Middle Kingdom. Without studying the archeological artifacts around site four, Fakhri uh, completely missed this early phase. Unfortunately, um, we can't completely reconstruct the Middle Kingdom uh, outline of the fort based on what we have. And then there's site six. Site six is not a mine or a fortified settlement, but it is important to understand the landscape around Wadi al Hudi in the Middle Kingdom. Site six is situated on a mountain between site five and site nine. And it is similarly situated at the entrance to the Wadi that leads you down to site four. More than 60 inscriptions are inscribed on the rocks of this mountain. Most of these depict men with weapons, and sometimes they have little inscribed titles uh, next to them that relate to hunting or guarding or soldiering. Um, this location affords great vistas of the surrounding landscape, not only uh, one of, of the mines, but also of the approaches to the mines from the road to the Nile Valley and uh, the road that goes through Wadi al Hudi itself deeper into the desert. And for this reason, un Others, we think Site 6 served primarily as a watch post for soldiers who guarded the mining expeditions, and secondarily, it was perhaps a post for hunters who were looking out for game to feed them. But Site 6 is not the only location at Wadi Hudi where we find inscriptions. So far, we have found at least 270 separate inscriptions on rocks around the archaeological site. The sites, almost all of them are from the Middle Kingdom, but some are medieval or later Arabic inscriptions. And the majority have been found at site five and site six, but the other archeological sites have them in much smaller numbers as well. Generally, these inscriptions fall into about three or four broad categories in terms of their content and the forms. First of all, there are historical inscriptions, which are left as records of the successes of mining expeditions and the people who ran them. These are done with a very formal style and they're usually made with um, hieroglyphs and they include the names of people involved in the expeditions and sometimes they give numbers of the different workers. Then there are things that I'm calling personal testimonies. They are written by individuals on the expedition or on their behalf, and they give their names and their titles, and they include kind of often a stylized picture of uh, the person. Sometimes these are written in a formal hieroglyphic script, like this stella here, WH-17, 
uh, which is customarily the way that you make a monument like this in ancient Egypt, but just as much they can be written in the cursive hieratic script, uh, in a kind of day-to-day -day writing script, uh, or they could include a mix of hieroglyphs and hieratic. Many other texts like this consist of just um, text, um, no pictures, and they give the names of and the titles of the people who are involved on the expedition, and those two can be written in hieroglyphs or completely in hieratic, like this example here. And interestingly, a larger percentage of those that are of the texts of Wadi Hudi that are written entirely in hieratic are this kind of text. And finally, among the personal inscriptions, we can count the numerous pictures of people that stand alone without any text attached to them, like those that we find at site six. And I would interpret these two as examples of personal testimonials done with similar intentions to those kinds of inscriptions with text, but they just lack text because they're being made by people who don't know how to write. A few inscriptions defy these categories, like this image of the king's name, of Motohotep IV, most often inscriptions will, meet, will be made directly onto rock outcrops around Wadi al Hudi, but sometimes uh, there are uh, very formally and nicely made stele that have been found there and uh, have these kinds of texts on them. Ahmed Fakhri published drawings and photographs of 142 of these inscriptions, which he studied at Wadi al Hudi, and in the years leading up to uh, and the conclusion of Fakhri's work, 40 of those inscriptions were actually removed from the sites and they were taken to Aswan and placed in the Aswan Museum on Elephantine Island. In 1983, another Egyptologist named Ashraf Sadak re-edited the inscriptions in the Aswan Museum and, and those left the site based mostly on Fakhri's drawings and photographs. Uh, the WH number system mentioned in this talk continues the original published numbering system that was used by Fakhri and Sadak. All of the inscriptions will be re-edited in a future volume of the Wadi Ahudi expeditions results along with photographs, drawings, 3D models and other data. These inscriptions, um, many of which have actually been studied since 1952 extensively, uh, give a lot of insights into the management of mining expeditions like this in Egypt's Middle Kingdom and from other periods as well. Another important data point that the text gives us is our sense of the chronology of the expeditions to Wadi al -Hudi. For instance, we know that the earliest text dates to year one of Pharaoh Montahotep IV, the last king of well, Egypt's 11th dynasty. And interestingly, many of the texts um, uh, of that pharaoh actually come from Wadi al Hudi. Uh, the others have been found in other mining ex uh, expedition sites, such as, such as Wadi Hamamat and Ain Sofna. Many inscriptions from Wadi al, Wadi al Hudi also date to the reign of Senwazir I, the second king of the 12th dynasty. And we have a few other texts that clearly date to Senwazir II, Senwazir III, and Amenemhat III. And the latest inscriptions at Wadi al Hudi date to the reign of Sobek Hotep IV. Uh, King who reigned at the term in the beginning of the terminal phase of the of Dynasty 13. Although the inscriptions from Wadi al Hudi have been much discussed in Egyptology since 1952, there was very little information about their archaeological context. Ahmed Fakhri only gave indications for the, where he discovered certain stele in certain sites, but not all of them. And um, None of them have specific information or maps indicating what parts of the sites of Wadi Hudi were found in. So from the beginning of our work at uh, Wadi Hudi, we've been mapping all of the inscriptions uh, left on site, including uh, their location around the architectural and, and other archeological features. And from the beginning of our work, we've been using 3D survey methods in all aspects of not just the inscriptions and epigraphy, but also the archeological documentation. Um, being both the project server and the sheet epigrapher. This is a project that I can do direct from both angles. Everywhere in site, we've been using a total station, like a total station to establish precise uh, locations for archaeological objects and inscriptions. Uh, and this has involved having a, an extensive site grid that we set up at least within the first two years. But this means that we have recorded all of the inscriptions at Wadi Hoodie within centimeters of their real UTM coordinates. And the 3D epigraphic recording of inscriptions consists, first and foremost, with establishing their locations on the ground. For this purpose, the reflectorless um, capability of the Leica total station is very useful because we can get within millimeters of uh, precise locations on the inscription. 
In the second stage of 3D recording and inscriptions, we've been taking a series of photographs to capture uh, all the inscribed surfaces um, from every available angle. And these photographs are then processed in the photogrammetry um, program that we're using. Mostly we've been using Agis Soft Metashape and Photoscan. And these produce a 3D model of the inscriptions and the surrounding rocks. And the control points measured on the total, from the total station were, were then able to place these 3D models in real world space. Uh, and incorporating the 3D models from the outset into the topographic survey, this has allowed us to deal with inscriptions as archaeological artifacts. Um, they're not just epigraphic artifacts, they're part of the whole big picture. They have spatial patterns that we're able to capture the, with this method. We have also done RTI photography of inscriptions. Um, and these can be incorporated into 3D models by using the same control points. Uh, but the result of RTI hasn't really been that favorable based on the stones that we have at Wadi Okudi. In addition to surveying inscriptions, we are producing 3D models of the archaeological landscape using wider photogrammetric surveys. And that's an important step since it means capturing in raw detail the actual physical locations of inscriptions and things that are around them. So far, we've got some very large resolution 3D models uh, of the, all the major archaeological sites of Wadi Hoodie using aerial photography when it's impossible to do that, and terrestrial photography other times with PVC pipes. <laughs> um, these terrestrial photographs um, are then used to render the, the 3D models of the art inscriptions and the architecture as well as the archaeology. Um, and this then allows us to derive anything that we want out of this, out of the field, including architectural drawings, epigraphic drawings, and maps. So before our work at Wadi Al no epigraphic quality drawings had been done of these inscriptions. All that was published in the Fakhri and Salik's work were sketches that were done of, of the kind of photographs that Fakhri made. And it's not necessarily um, that they didn't do all of the work that they could have. It's very hard to do epigraphic drawings of these kinds of inscriptions because they are made on rocks. Most epigraphic techniques assume a flat surface upon which you can make a drawing, but none of the inscriptions that Wally Hood are done on flat surfaces. It's not, uh, but by using 3D drawing uh, tools available in Azusoft and other programs, uh, we've been able to make epigraphic drawings um, even on non flat surfaces. Doing it in a computer also allows us to get really close to inscriptions and, and make pixel resolution decisions about what is assigned versus what isn't assigned. And in real world terms, these come down to micrometer uh, precision. Most importantly, I think, doing these in a photogrammetric method means you can pull them out and put them into a map or a 3D rendering immediately. You don't have to convert anything. And so uh, the rest of the talk, I want to explain a little bit how studying these descriptions in 3D is informed with understanding their meaning behind them as messages that ancient people were trying to leave for people to understand after them. And it's apparent from studying them in their context like this, that the location that specific inscriptions are placed in their archeological sites is a huge factor in understanding their meaning. And that place dependent meaning of inscriptions at Wadi Hudi is something I find intriguing, and it's been largely absent from the interpretation of these texts since their initial publication. So how do you go about capturing that kind of meaning? Um, that's not a very easy task, uh, as you may think, because surprisingly, um, situating texts in, in particular places uh, hasn't really been developed as a methodology fully in Egyptology. Uh, in Egyptology, especially, Texts in places are an important part of visual culture. But Egypt, the discipline of Egyptology has focused uh, mostly on, on the linguistic analysis of these kinds of texts, discerning grammar, semantics, and syntax. And it hasn't really developed a very formal methodology for studying texts as a semiotic performance. Um, that is to say, why texts get inscribed in certain places and how that changes their meaning. Um, in fact, Egyptology frequently takes for granted the normality of texts being in certain places, such as tombs, temples, and other contexts. Um, and there's an assumption that there's uh, frequently a particular activity behind those, such as rituals, uh, and that just informs the meaning of those texts being there. But when you find texts in places that you don't expect them, and especially when you find them outside of buildings, like we do at Wadi Ohodi, that 
brings you back to first principles to figure out why are things being placed where they're being placed. So in order to study the place-based meaning of inscriptions at Wadi Yohudi, I'm considering another methodology, and that is geosemiotics. So what is geosemiotics? Uh, it's a subfield of linguistic anthropology that examines how language is inscribed in places and how it is connected to activities around it. It's a methodology that was outlined initially by Ronald Skolon and Suzanne Wong Skolon in a book introducing it as a subfield called Discourses in Place. And their methodology has been, been used by several other studies on topics about language and its, its uh, situation, uh, especially language such as advertising, graffiti, and architecture. Um, but it is equally applicable to ancient texts as long as we understand something about the epigraphic habits that are being used in creating ancient texts. So there are three broad principles of geosemiotics, indexicality, dialogicality, and selection. Indexicality is the broadest category and encompasses the systemic mechanisms for generating meaning with language. Skolan and Wong Skolan identify three geosemiotic systems related to indexicality. There is interaction order, visual semiotics, and place semiotics. And I'm focusing especially on place semiotics. This emphasizes that there is a situational meaning of signs as well as uh, the references found in signs to activities that are around them and the, the way that those activities are understood and described as uh, forms of discourse. So the second principle of geosemiotics is dialogicality. And this principle emphasizes that texts inscribed in places attract other texts and they make reference to them. Over time, all of those texts in a certain place engage in a complicated interchange of meaning uh, that creates a kind of dialogue. And over time, that dialogue reaches a kind of a harmony or uh, in which things are being said over and over again and emphasizing certain points. Uh, and this is what uh, Skolan and Wong Skolan called this semiotic aggregate. So things kind of repeat over time. Uh, the third principle of geosemiotics is selection. And the principle recognizes that people who create and observe symbols are social actors and their act of creating their symbols uh, involves selecting things that are important that they want to emphasize, and especially things that come out of discourses about why you're doing something. Uh, the idea is intrinsically connected to the concept of discourse. Uh, discourses are organizing patterns of language and signs connected to topics, people, and power relationships. Uh, discourses assume social roles for speakers and listeners, and they afford uh, hegemonic authority for those people as well. So. Those principles of uh, geosemiotics are relevant to inscriptions as they are found in the archaeological landscape at Wadi Yohudi. For example, there is this inscription, which I've already shown you, it's WH4. It's one that is still inscribed on the rocks uh, at Wadi Yohudi Site 5, which means we can really see how it connects with where it's inscribed. And it's perhaps one of the earliest inscriptions from Wadi Yohudi. It gives an account of the success of mining expeditions in year one or two and two of Montahotep IV, the last king of the 11th dynasty, it names the leader of this expedition, Intef son of Tashidu, and it names other officials who were uh, going to Wadi Yohudi with him. And interestingly, at the end, uh, it gives you a part that has so far not been translated well and is unique for um, text at Wadi Yohudi. It gives a precise amount of the amethyst that they acquired in this expedition. And the text participates generally in a discourse of official storytelling uh, and elite self-presentation. Uh, there are only a few texts like this from Wadi Yohudi, and this is the only one left on site. Uh, the other texts like this, especially from this area, are WH6 and WH14. So what is important about the place where WH4 was inscribed? Well, a structural analysis of the walls around Site 5 showed that this location was very important, being near the public entrance to the settlement and in a wide open courtyard. Interestingly, Fechri tells us that WH6 uh, and WH14 were found near here. They're not there now because they were removed to Aswan, but they were placed somewhere near WH4. And collectively, all of these delays seem to give the same kind of accounts of expeditions that happened in a certain king's reign in Motahat IV or Sunnah I. And they're participating then in the same kind of talking about the same kinds of things. Um, and the location that they're at is moreover in eyeshot of another uh, 13 inscriptions. And so this place where they're being inscribed is highly visible. 
um, it's chosen over and over again for making descriptions that assume kind of importance to them. Uh, and it's a, a good illustration of the principle of dialogicality in text because these things are all con uh, contributing to a bigger message. The imagined audience for these inscriptions would probably be the people who are inscribing the other ones, the administrators who come to Wadi Ohudi in the next expedition to do the same thing that you just claimed that you did successfully. So all of these are creating that semiotic aggregate talking about the successes of making an expedition like this and how well we did it ourselves. So that makes another set of inscriptions found in that that found nearby that date to the reign of King Montehotu IV. Very interesting to study uh, for another kind of interaction. And these texts illustrate uh, the geosemiotic principle of transgressive emplacement. Three inscriptions at site five, very close by, WH3, WH26, and WH208 are currently built into the walls of the enclosure of the settlement. Although, um, when Ahmed Fekri came there, he uncovered these inscriptions and, and you can see them nowadays. Originally, there were blocks on top of them that completely made them invisible. And that's probably purposeful. <laughs> the transgressive nature of building a wall on top of these inscriptions, I think, assumes that they were built, that that wall was built after the reign of Montehotep IV, when all of these date to. Elsewhere at Site 5, Montehotep IV's cartouches have actually been erased, indicating that the people who, who came after his reign didn't really treat his monuments with, with much respect. None of the inscriptions of later pharaohs of the 12th dynasty are treated this way. It's therefore very relevant to note that Montehotep IV was the last pharaoh of the 11th dynasty, and his successor, Amenemhat I, first pharaoh of the 12th dynasty, was also Montehotep Vizier who took over after some kind of intrigue. So these inscriptions indicate that there was some kind of effort, whether official or unofficial, to kind of erase the memory of Montana IV in developing these amethyst spines. And that geosemiotic perspective therefore highlights that these inscriptions are not just singular events, they're continuing to be uh, manipulated and, and uh, engaged with to create additional uh, nuances to the message of, what, of them being there in the first place. So site nine similarly has an interesting set of inscriptions for a geosemiotic perspective. These inscriptions have been found uh, attest to the duration of the time of the use of site nine. And that's an important topic to, to uh, study because before now there were no inscriptions from site nine and we really didn't know how long it was used or when it was used. Unfortunately, Ahmed Fekri, there were probably inscriptions from site nine, but unfortunately Ahmed Fekri gave us no information about any of them being uh, but we have found some inscriptions nearby site nine, and we have found some clues about other ones that have originally been there. In our first season at Wadi Ohudi, I found three inscribed stele on top of rock outcrop situated about 200 meters to the south of site nine, which we then gave the, the, the name site 15. Um, and that the reason why they're there is that rock is a little bit too far away from site nine for anyone just wandering around to have um, come across. But it made a great place for a total station and so setting it up there, I happened to step on these, um, these stele. Um, and it was very likely the reason uh, that it made it a great place for a tunnel station was also the same reason why it was used in antiquity. It was a platform. Um, and in fact, these uh, stele on that rock constitute what the geosemiotic perspective calls a platform event. Um, these stele include, importantly in them, a year 28 of the reign of King Sinor I. And they give the people's names, titles, and details about expeditions uh, performed in that year. Uh, they were likely set up in this place looking at Site 9, which gives us a reference commenting, therefore, on that fortress. Uh, the, the commenting of a text on something that's within visible range of it is a geosemiotic um, uh, feature called exophoric reference. The geosemiotic interpretation of these stele therefore provides a real piece of archaeological data, data that Site 9 was in operation in year 28 of San Walter I. And that's important because up until now, their only speculation about when it dated to was later in the 12th dynasty. 
And the discovery of these new stelates near Site 9 also leads me to really want to know where this inscription comes from. It is a very good illustration of how removing a text like this from its spatial context completely obscures its meaning. WH-143 is the first stella that was ever taken away from Wadi Ohri by the Antiquity Service in 1939. It's now in the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It was set up in Wadi Ohri in honor of an expedition commander named Horus at some point in the reign of Sun Rosa I. He doesn't give a year date. It is interesting that the only stella from Wadi Ohri uh, made of, it is the only one made of limestone, and it is manufactured in a way uh, with, and with an inscription that shows that it was done by people who make royal stelae in a royal workshop and residence. And this therefore implies that the expedition commander Horus, who's honored by the stella, had it made in, in the royal residence in the north, floated it to the south, up the Nile to Aswan, and then had it dragged 30 kilometers into the desert just so he could put it somewhere for his own benefit. It's a huge misfortune that we don't know where it, this stella was set up because Ahmed Fekri only heard about where it was secondhand and his account actually gives two different locations. It's muddled. Um, he says maybe site five, five, maybe site six, but I would also consider it a possibility that it came somewhere from near site nine or somewhere between site five and site nine. And this stella furthermore illustrates the system of visual semiotics and the principle of selection of discourses. The visual semiotics of this stella are quite unique uh, and that fact that they, uh, it is entirely, it is the only thing made of limestone. And the stella displays the carved depiction of the, the royal insignia of the king. Uh, and that's the things uh, that are being uh, made like that in uh, the royal workshops. And the stella makes uh, several references to kind of discourses, the way things are talked about. A long part at the beginning uh, in the first 10 lines consists of a praise of Sanoza the first which is indicative of a genre of text that Egyptologists call the loyalist literature. And this segues into a section describing the official order that the king gave to Horus to undertake his mission to Wadi Ul Hudi. And interestingly, in that uh, official section, it gives an interesting detail that Horus had to build something called beautiful is he in this desert. Finally, it ends with a frankly racist statement about how all Nubians work as slaves because of fear of the king. And that statement is actually indicative of another discourse that you find, especially in the reign of Sonos of the first of subjugation of foreign power, uh, foreign um, peoples to the, the strength uh, and the, the fear of the king. It's strongly contrasting with another statement that was made earlier on WH4, uh, dated uh, to Montehut IV, where it says that Nubians came to Wadi al uh, to participate in the mining expeditions out of respect for the commander of the expeditions. What is notable about this stella is that we are missing its emplacement since the published account of where it came from is conflicted. Consequently, we can't say for certain what the place beautiful as he in this desert refers to and why the Nubians are mentioned so prominently and in a degrading way. But it's very likely that this is the name for site nine since beautiful is he in this desert is the kind of name that we find for fortresses and settlements that are made in the Middle Kingdom. And we have learned from the structures of the walls of site nine that they were made in a manner found elsewhere only in the Nubian settlements. And they were likely made then by Nubians who had a habitual knowledge about how to make dry stone walls this way. Horus' stella and the stele that I discovered at site 15 give us one precise chronological bookend for the founding of site nine, but we don't know when it was abandoned. The pottery found at the site indicates an occupation through the mid to the 12th, late 12th dynasty and into the 13th dynasty. <clears throat> but it doesn't provide any more precise um, chronological indicators. Likely, other inscriptions were once set up around Site 9 to commemorate the expeditions that were happening in that time. In fact, we found a few emplacements, that is, the locations where the inscriptions were set up. These consist of kind of ring of stones with a hole in the middle. <clears throat> and we found overturned versions of two of these inscriptions, one near the walls and one near a spoil heap in the mines. <clears throat> a stella found at the end of the spoil. Uh, he is picking on the right. Uh, we don't know exactly which of the other 40 inscriptions that are now in the Aswan Museum came from Site 9. Perhaps except one. 2016, we were working at another site, Site 4, and discovered several fragments of a stella there that were made of the, um, characteristically of a beige colored sandstone. 
And that sandstone is not native to Wadi Hood. In fact, you don't find much sandstone in Wadi Hood at all. Uh, we identified that as a Stella, um, uh, and we were able to reconstruct that Stella. And then we went back to site nine and did work, and I began to notice that there are small pieces of line of sandstone on the ground in the corner of the site near the walls. And uh, we went back there in 2019, and I think it was actually Carly that found the largest fragment of one of these things there. <clears throat> this is her name. Uh, interestingly, the sandstone Stella that um, fits this among those stelae in the Aswan Museum uh, is WH23. No others have the right color or the missing pieces that would suit this. And that would be really interesting if this Stella is WH23. Because that, that still is one of the latest stelae that came from Wadi Ohad it, in the Middle Kingdom. It dates to the reign of a pharaoh of the 13th dynasty, probably Sultan like Khotep IV. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the other stella that we found at Site IV dates to the reign of Sultan like Khotep IV. And the location that we found these fragments of the stella is also kind of weird. It, it occurs in an area uh, outside of the fortress and very near to a mining excavation. And that kind of excavation was identified by Ian Shaw as being potentially one of the last mines uh, made at Wadi Hudi because it kind of intrudes on the fortress and knocks a wall down that was built very late. So um, this still may then set up uh, kind of the second bookend for the occupation of site nine, the end of the, the occupation of the site. And its location in that place may have directly exophoric reference to the mine made there. So that was site nine. So finally, I want to show you the inscriptions that I mentioned earlier at site six. And these will offer another very interesting example of kind of a geosemiotic analysis. Several of the inscriptions from site six illustrate the principle of discourses and semiotic aggregate. At site six, the vast majority of the inscriptions consist of pictures of standing men holding sticks or bows and arrows, such as WH106. Uh, where these inscriptions occur, they, uh, where inscriptions of text occur around these, they're primarily in hieratic, the workaday language, uh, the workaday writing uh, script. Um, the titles presented here are always of a military or a police nature. Some of these uh, texts um, include images of uh, men with weapons and sometimes men uh, hunting animals. And the few texts that uh, were inscribed here include titles of individuals who were hunters or dog wranglers or soldiers on expeditions. Site six happens to be situated on the very top of a mountain that overlooks the ancient mines. And the inference that we have from it being there is that this is a sentry post. It is a place to watch over the mines to protect the miners and to perhaps make sure that they don't leave. Uh, but another thing that we now see especially from an analysis of the animal bones at site five is that people were eating a lot of gazelle. So there must have been hunters and this would make a great place to look for gazelle. So this may actually be the explanation of the behind the wrangler, the, the herders of dogs, hunting dogs. That's an idea. At site six, we also see a thing called transgressive emplacement. That is where someone has depicted um, the, a, a sign that kind of changes the meaning of another sign. And this happens, especially at site six, where soldiers appear to have depicted themselves assaulting, smiting, or otherwise abusing a prior image, especially of an animal. Uh, you see that, in, for example, in WH-135, where a soldier uh, who uh, must be later, because the patina is a little bit, bit different, uh, is depicted uh, stabbing an older version of a, of a description that was there depicting a cow. A long -term cow. And again, WH-135, we see the soldier uh, in the middle here actually is depicted himself holding an animal uh, in front of him. It's perhaps an elephant or a rhinoceros. It's some kind of horned animal. Uh, but it's interesting because that animal is not appropriate for that place. And it, it seems to fit with the other figures next to it to the right as part of one kind of tableau. Uh, and the patina of those figures is different from the soldier. And they, that would indicate that there's a lack of, of contemporaneity between the two images. And interestingly, uh, those depicted on the right, the people depicted on the right, have a stance in the body kind of representation that you find, especially in pre-dynastic art. 
So we actually think that this is the kind of interaction that's going on. Um, and we see other cases that may be pre-dynastic art here on the right in another inscription from uh, site six at WH152. Uh, these images are showing therefore a kind, another kind of transgressive emplacement uh, where the middle kingdom soldiers have depicted themselves um, handling one of the, the animals from the pre-dynastic period in a way that they're going to smite them in the characteristic smiting scene of Roman art. And they did this perhaps because they saw these images and they thought, hey, this would be a great thing to do, or they had the time on their hands because they were bored on top of the mountain. I've mentioned that several inscriptions at Site 6 mix hieroglyphs and hieratic in an interesting way. Um, and one of these that does this is this inscription. This inscription um, depicts a person whose name is Memi. And he's given the title of warrior of the town, which is a very low title for a soldier in the Middle Kingdom. Nevertheless, this text uses some very interesting variations uh, on the autobiographies that you find in the Middle Kingdom. Uh, he's, he claims to be praised of his commanding officer and beloved of his wife, Tidihotep. And the writing style used by Memi is particularly interesting because it imitates a hieratic writing style that is the kind that you find in letters. It's a fancy style that you begin a letter with, you, you make these very long squiggly um, uh, strokes in the beginning of the letter and they, they cover the entire column of uh, papyrus letter. And so someone would really have to know that's how you write a letter um, to be able to imitate this in an inscription. And so from that inscription, it appears that Memi is an interesting person. He's a lowly soldier, but he nevertheless had some kind of education that will allow him to imitate this, the handwriting of a fancy letter. And a uh, final interesting text that we have at slide six, I just want to mention here uh, quickly is WH31. And if, I'm sorry, it's very faint, but you'll have to take my word for it. What you have there is an image of a man grappling another man by the, by the neck and holding an ankle, which is an unusual posture for uh, interactions of figures in ancient Egyptian art. Uh, the inscription on its side says overthrowing the Asiatic. And the inscription that used to be there, although it's now broken off, um, says Iker, the, the Asiatic. So this is a really interesting inscription um, because it, according to the text, it should show what you would expect to be kind of a traditional smiting scene of someone killing a foreign enemy. But the postures of these individuals are not appropriate for that. And very likely this came from site six based on the type of rock it's made on. Rather, what it's showing is a very complicated wrestling move. And we have wrestling scenes from several tombs of the early Middle Kingdom where this was made. And the one I show you here is from the tomb of Bucket in, in Ben Hassan. And there was, so there was a definite interest in the sport of wrestling in Egypt at that time. Um, and as you notice from the tomb of Bucket, the two individuals are depicted with different skin colors, and that's led to endless speculation about who these people may, in, may represent, whether they represent Nubians and Asiatics or Libyans and Egyptians. And to that point, the inscription on that rock at site six is very interesting because it said it mentions the Asiatics prominently twice. So perhaps the competitors um, in this wrestling scene from site six are foreigners or take on the role of foreigners in this kind of, the, the story of this, this wrestling badge. And taking the principles of geosemiotics into account, this inscription, if it does come from site six, should be a self-representation uh, akin to all those images of men who are holding uh, weapons and bows, uh, weapons and sticks. Uh, it should be in line with the discourse of self-representation of martial prowess for a uh, formal ability as a soldier that we find in all the other inscriptions. So this is a very interesting inscription if it is in that same thing. It's a, it therefore shows a soldier styled as an Asiatic who wants to show off a remarkable ability to wrestle. And he would Anticipate then that the audience who saw this were soldiers like himself, who came up to the rock and um, had time on their hands. So to summarize, Wadi Hoodie is a fascinating place to study the use of texts in its context. Sometimes we have to reconstruct the context 
for the important inscriptions that have been removed from the site, documenting the inscriptions at Wadi Ahudi in the spatial context, and interpreting them with a geosemiotic methodology allows for a more nuanced interpretation of their meaning. The Middle Kingdom miners left their inscriptions there specifically to explain why they had come to Wadi Ahudi and what they did. In the next step of our project, we're going to be taking our survey of one particular site, Site 9, to the next level of building a virtual reality environment and embedding the archeological and epigraphic data from the field work in it. And this is something I'm going to be working on with Kate Liska and a group of Cal State University San Bernardino students over the summer. You can follow our progress or che check on the renders of these model, models, the 3D models, and learn more about our project on Instagrams, on Twitter, and Facebook, run by our web guru, Brooke Norton. Uh, or you can check out our website, wadiyohudi.com, for updates on our work. Minzaman del Arabi Kamen, y ahora en español. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>